Hello, and welcome to our channel, MarsStream, your public performance broadcast platform. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can also donate to our tip jar and support the arts and artists of MarsStream by clicking the link below in the description. Check out our website, themarsh.org, for all upcoming live performances. Now, enjoy the show. Hi, thanks so much for coming to the Marsh tonight. And of course, by the Marsh, I mean my living room and the homes of the performers you're going to see here tonight. I wanted to mention that tonight we will have a couple of microphones unmuted so that the performers will have the benefit of some auditory feedback. Um, but most of you, uh, your microphones will stay muted and we would love to get uh, your appreciation in the chat. Um, the work you're going to see here tonight is all new. A couple months ago, this did not exist. So just wanted to thank you for being a part of this small miracle. And then without further ado, I'd love to introduce our first performer tonight. Please, uh, let's welcome Lambeth Sterling. I want to take a moment to make it perfectly clear that my relationships with men in real life in New York in the 1970s bore no resemblance to the relationship Rocky Balboa had with Adrian. <laughs> Watching the movie Rocky 27 times was kind of like a visualization in and of itself. In 1977, I managed to manifest an actor named Arnold, who, like Rocky, had very low self-esteem. Except this guy was also not good looking. I got part of what I was visualizing, so I took what I got. Turns out, visualization is not a science. His hair was teased 10 inches high because he felt his head was too small. He had a <laughs> laugh that sounded like this. <laughs> and I didn't think it was a problem that he was only performing in a bar. I went down to the bar one night and it bothered me not one bit that everyone in the audience was dressed in leather and chains except me. <laughs> or that the bar was called something like the cock. <laughs> Arnold lived near the UN and was into inner work, so we had that in common. I like the UN. He was into rebirthing, which involves processing your issues in a hot tub with a snorkel while hyperventilating until you turn blue. I think my sister introduced him to rebirthing. She was just telling me this week, I've lost my snorkel. <laughs> Anyway, Arnold was into rebirthing and chain smoking. <laughs> Here's the thing. I got terribly sad and depressed about all of this, telling you all of this. And I worry a lot that my 98 year old Auntie M might somehow find out that I talk in these videos. Her daughter is doing TED Talks on important issues. And I'm out here talking about fucking a guy near the UN. <laughs> See, I wasn't always exactly like I am now. Not that I'm so great now. My dating life a long time ago, well, it's embarrassing. By the way, three months after I saw that play at the cock, Arnold was delighted to tell me, I've been dating and screwing a guy for three months. And I was taken aback. Shocked. <laughs> Where were the indicators? Where were the red flags? We went to my unlicensed counselor and he had me hit the bed with the red bataka bat and yell, How dare you? How dare you? God knows what the neighbors think. Arnold just sat there and smiled. I don't know if I told the counselor about that bar, the cock. Just handling the feelings is not going to do the trick. I finally figured out I needed to reverse engineer my entire life. I want to tell you now you could hire me as a risk assessment expert. 
Everywhere I look, I see the risk. Everywhere I look, you name it, I see risk. I have metamorphed. I have changed. I have become a butterfly of risk assessment. I, by the way, have been loving the pandemic. This staying inside without having to invite anyone over with the exception of the <laughs> holidays, which I happen to like, is what I have been waiting for all my fucking life. <laughs> I love seeing my stepkids and their partners. Of course, I love kids, but they come with adults. On Valentine's Day, we got a text at nine in the morning that one of the scout moms from my husband's scout troop wanted to come by and bring a gift. Isn't that nice? She brought her tiny grandson and had him give my husband an enormous bouquet of pink roses. These roses have opened on the dining room table where the cut glass vase normally sits. They have opened like 18 vaginas. I wanted to crush or eat every single one of them. I can't say anything like this in public. What I can tell you is, She's not married, and I think she wants him for herself. You know, they're both grandparents. Oh, 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 they're both grandparents. Oh, it's so romantic. Vaginas all over the dining room table. <laughs> to mitigate the damage I may be doing here, I just want to say this redhead looks 20 years younger than I do is at least 10 years younger and drives a very sexy, expensive red convertible. I don't need her in my driveway. <laughs> I asked David Ford if he thinks it's a problem for me to say any of this. And he said, well, it reads mostly like my jealousy. I certainly hope so. Anyway, this is not how I was. I saw no risk. I am now the Charlie Munger of relationships. Munger, Warren Buffett's partner, was just quoting Oscar Wilde this week. At 97, he's quoting Oscar Wilde on fox hunting. He's talking about a certain category of high risk stocks that people shouldn't be buying. The unspeakable, in full pursuit of the uneatable. <laughs> That's dating as far as I'm concerned. Also, marriage. The next guy I dated was a big step up from Arnold. I met a filmmaker, much better looking. When he went to touch my hand the day I met him, I took a push pin and jabbed it into the base of his thumb. This was the last sensible thing I did in this relationship. The evening before the first date with him, think Bruce Willis. Die hard, not moonlighting. Bruce Willis with great hair. I repeat, phenomenal hair. I made my royal blue cotton yoga pants into a skirt with a split up the middle. This is pretty ah. I took the bus to Macy's to get the right pair of stockings. I went to his apartment. Very tasteful, all very tasteful furniture. Masculine, no clutter, very clean. Voice like an expensive cut of roast beef. I don't eat meat, but like Chateau Briand. Hmm. It was clear that the maid had been there. I didn't have a maid. And the corner of the bed was turned down. He tied me up, took some pictures. I regret to inform you we had some sex. We're talking stone cold sober and went to dinner. Yes, there was a whip. Dinner was awkward. <laughs> he would call me at work and tell the receptionist that Van Morrison was calling. If he was in a bad mood, he would say his name was Steely Dan. He showed me the pictures of myself bound. Should I enact bound at this age? I don't think so. Bound and smiling. Do it yourself porn. He gave me one of those pictures. I just threw it out this year. Yeah. Now I regret it. I did look better in that picture than I look most days. I never look quite that good anymore. 
although I have worn a bra to bed for years. I shouldn't say that either. You have to prevent stretch marks. Nobody should get their boob size increased. It hurts your back. And I learned on Shark Tank, you can't lie in your stomach without a special pillow if you do that. Bruce made a point of telling me that he got rid of the whip on the second date. I didn't want to tell you it was the second date. I didn't ask him to get rid of the whip. He did this on his own, which I thought was very nice. Listen, people can have whatever kind of sex they want. Bondage, <gasps> S&M. This is not what I wanted. Not that I said so. It wasn't about the talking. There was no talking. I told no one at the Center for the Lower Self where I was doing my inner work or anywhere else that I was dating him. I would say I was in love with him a phrase I normally find to be consistently suspect now. It is a red flag in and of itself, in my opinion. It means the mind has gone on sabbatical and may or may not return until you have almost died of some circumstance in which you have allowed yourself to be deeply and regrettably compromised by some <gasps> desperation. <gasps> left over from your relationship with your family of origin, with one of your early caregivers, specifically, very likely, your mother. Waylon said the other day when I was using his hand for balance, there's nothing romantic about this. You know, kind of asking me. I said, I do not believe in romance. Can you imagine how difficult life is for Waylon? <laughs> Although I would like to point out that John Lennon picked the only woman on the planet who said no to him. This is what romance is made of. Someone who will trigger your unhealed wounds. Romance is, I now believe, a very unfortunate contrivance through which life is trying to trick you into learning something simply a ploy to trick you into learning something. And I learned not to believe in romance or worse, to fall for sexual attraction after about 20 years. I saw an article by a therapist recently that said this chemical assault, this chemical attack in the brain we call attraction is probably a very good indicator that this partner is a good choice. This fucking couples therapist is a liar. She's lying. How many mistakes have you made based on this concoction of trauma related chemicals going off in the brain? And people say, if I had just accepted the nice guys who wanted to be with me. Really? By the time you get to my age, all the nice guys have tried to cheat on their wives with you. Ah, when you ah. fall in love, life is very likely trying to help you understand what is deeply wrong with you. And everything you never dreamed of wanting to know about your relationships with your parents and every fucking sibling you have, not to mention your cousins. Listen, this early childhood wounding thing, it'll drive you to eat dirt thinking you're going to get somewhere in life doing that. Yeah, you're learning something. You're learning not to eat dirt. And isn't it nice of life to teach you that? Have you seen some of the people who are studying the Course in Miracles, by the way? They're willing to turn themselves inside out for love and forgiveness no matter how many times they've been cheated on. Spiritual bypass going around the issue can be used, not effectively, but it can be used by any fool who is stupid enough not to see you can forgive people without fucking them. Yeah. Yeah. 
You don't have to fuck them to forgive them. Fucking is not required for forgiveness. You stay over there. I will stay over here. You send me the alimony. You keep out of my fucking house. I fucking forgive you. Anyone who's saying, oh, I can live with you and forget all the stuff I saw on your computer and in your drawer and on your collar and up your nose. This is not Jesus-like behavior, not Buddha either. Neither of them were that stupid. They gave up sex, and the older I get, the more sense that makes to me. Like Buddha said, this life is suffering. More suffering if you're married. Anyway, Bruce had this scrumptious, deep voice. I'm telling you, this is better than porn. Porn's addictive, you know. I really suggest you not watch it. Makes you like a Harley motorcycle in bed, according to my much younger friends who are still out there dating. Like this, metal, cold metal, just cold silver steel. We're not talking about pistons here. I'm talking about how you can become as clueless about sensuality as a Harley motorcycle lying on its side in bed. <laughs> Harley can't do sensual. I can't show you on Zoom. This is what my younger friends report. That's another reason why lesbianism is perhaps a better choice. Women are watching less porn because they are smarter. You're not supposed to say that. I'm so glad I came out pre-online porn. No, I am not a lesbian. I was a debutante. See, I come from a time when your family made you come out. Sensual is what you want. And you can't learn that from a videotape of a woman with her mouth open. <gasps> a woman who is acting like she's <gasps> happy like that. <gasps> she's getting paid. If this is your classroom, at best you're driving over people in bed. I should be talking to high school students, right? That's my calling. No one is going to let me talk to high school students. My scoutmaster husband has confirmed this. <laughs> this time in New York is pre-porn. Bruce and I were together the day Jim Jones followers down the Kool-Aid. Definitely one of our most romantic moments. We sat on his couch facing straight forward, looking stunned. He had joined his own therapy group, so he said, You have your cult. I have mine. I really cannot think of Jim Jones without thinking of Bruce. When I went to see Rocky II at least 27 times, I didn't mention it to Bruce. This was an easy secret to keep since our discussions were limited to work. My pronunciation, my pronunciation of woulda, coulda, in, and wouldn't which he didn't like, and my inability to use a tea bag properly. <laughs> Bruce said, No woman I date would leave her tea bag in her cup. They all have southern accents. So I made this the one issue on which I took a stand. I said, I would. That's it. That's one of the two times I stood up in the three years I saw him three times a week. The time I got VD because he disappeared over the Christmas holidays and had sex with a prostitute, which resulted in me landing in the hospital, I said nothing. He didn't come to the hospital. I'm not going to say the hospital was two hours away. He gave me a handmade pillow for Christmas. 
I had painted on a house in the country with his two boys from his first marriage playing outside and smoke coming from the chimney because I would be in the house. My vision was I would be in the house with the smoke coming out of the chimney. I didn't tell him that. When I gave him the pillow, he said, you always shock me. I sang, plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. The Alka-Seltzer thing throughout the abortion. This is not what they taught me in the choir at church where what I took from the readings was, I should give away my shirt, which I translated to mean, take off my shirt. <laughs> I went to the Rocky films, that's what I did. Each of them 27 times. Never told Bruce or anybody else, because I want my life to be like that. I want my life to be like that. Boom, 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 boom. Now here I am at my age talking about Sylvester Stallone. It doesn't make any sense to anybody. And I'm having these shame attacks now. Anyway, I sat there, I'm watching that thing 27 times because it's not only Adrian, he gave her a makeover and I could use a makeover, but we go into this pet shop and he's nice to her. He's kind to her. She's ugly and he's kind to her. Anyway, I like that about Rocky. He was kind to his turtles in secret. Not exactly the way my mother felt about me. And I wanted to be like my dad. How come I'm stuck in this damn female body? I never wanted to be five feet, two and a half inches and female. The fact is, if you don't lead with vulnerability, people hate you. And that is just not who I am anymore. I can hear therapists saying, during that period, you were exhibiting weakness. And true vulnerability is strength. Go fuck yourselves. I'm yeah. better and I'm bitter. I'm bitter and I'm better. And I like bitter much fucking better. The pain is under the bitterness, but I like that phrase. Can you imagine what my husband would give for me to have no words to stand up for myself now? What Waylon would do for a little woman who just couldn't possibly find a way to stand up for herself. A little woman who is into bondage and submission. Oh my God. A woman who would allow him to tie her up with all of his scout knots. With his foot fetish. I can't say that. I've just told every woman who's interested in him to wear sandals and paint her toes. That'll do it, ladies. A little woman who's barefoot in the kitchen and cooking. Might as well bring some rope. You'll enjoy all of the camping and the snakes. It was into this arena or pit. And at this time, in my life with Bruce, that Rocky, the Italian stallion, rode into my life. Hey. Hey. Really? Two sizes too big? Thank God they could alter it before the wedding next week. I wrestle my wedding gown in its protective plastic bag 
out of the car and into the house. Hey, honey, how does the gown fit now? My mother looks up from stirring a pot of spaghetti sauce and I drop her car keys on the kitchen counter. Oh, and you've got a letter. Yeah, they say they've never had a wedding gown come in two sizes too big, but it looks gorgeous now. Well, no return address. Tiny handwriting. This is a guy's handwriting. I walk down the hall to my bedroom. Dear Carol, there's something I should have said a long time ago, but I've never been really good at this stuff. I hope it's not too late. What is this? I thought I knew darkness, but I didn't, not really, not until you went away to school. My new car distracted me for a while, but I knew what was really missing, you. I miss those days at the playground talking to you. The way we are together, it's different than how it is with anyone else. And that's because I'm in love with you. I couldn't let you get married without asking you to reconsider. Marry me. Really? Now? 10 years earlier, I've got textbooks stacked in the crook of my arm. I nudge my best friend. Wow, Becky, who's that? It's Vic Camerata. He just transferred here for seventh grade. He's a total hunk. Stop staring. I can't help it. He towers over everyone. I thought he was a teacher. Six foot in seventh grade, maybe even taller. Leather tie shoes, dark pants. Don't you think he looks like Lance in more than a summer love? I don't know, I haven't read it. I glance at the top book in her stack, The Bell Jar, the serious girl's Bible. <laughs> Figure she'd read it before me. So I turn into my homeroom. Hey, boo-boos, it's the new guy in my homeroom, mimicking Yogi Bear. I hate Yogi Bear, but who cares? Some of the boys laugh, Vic laughs too, and he lowers his tall frame into the too small wooden desk right in front of mine. I smile at him. Smiling back, he nods. Hi, I venture. Did he nod again? Oh, he's turning back in his seat. The teacher is droning roll call, but I can't think of anyone but this new guy. He is so dreamy. Did he look at me when he sat down? Is he smiling at me? Do you remember those giddy preteen years when everything was so new, so thrilling, before life beat that excitement? out of us. What I wouldn't give now to feel a little of that now. Ignoring my seventh grade English teacher, I daydream about Vic. Actually, I do that in every class. I write his name in curly Q cursive on my notebook, and I scribble it out real fast before anyone can see it. After school, I dump my books on the dresser and lounge on my bed. Transistor radio to my ear. I'm singing along with the Supremes. You can't hurry, love. You'll just have to wait. You gotta trust. Give it time. Diana Ross and the girls, they're singing to me. Carol, come to dinner. Carol, dinner's ready. <sighs> Mom. My mom's voice jars me from my fantasy and I click off the radio and head down the hall to dinner. Five o'clock. Not a minute later. My father demands it. But that night, I snuggle into my pillow. Sounds from the family room TV fade and I imagine myself with Vic at a summer beach party, sneaking off into the dark woods kissing and kissing and kissing 
Now, I've never actually been to a beach party. I've never been kissed. Fat chance my Sicilian dad would ever let me out. He never lets me do anything. I'm too young. I wonder when I won't be too young. Maybe when I'm 30. Doesn't matter. Every night in my imagination, I live an entirely different life with Vic. Kissing in the woods every night. What do you think they're laughing about? I asked Becky one day, looking over at Vic, who's huddled with his pals by his locker. Oh, I don't know. They're so immature. She smooths her blue wool turtleneck down over her hips. Her tights match. Very feet neck. In spelling class, in the seat in front of mine, she's asked to spell roguish and define it. Roguish, that's how Vic laughs. Don't roll your eyes at me. <laughs> I wonder what it would be like to laugh all the time like Vic. He and his parents probably crack jokes at his dinner table. My father's opinions, not jokes, dominate ours. Usually, he berates my mother for being too fat, but he's got opinions on everything. The trouble with this country is that commie, Dr. Spock, and the kind of permissive parenting he promotes. He rants as he spears a piece of well-done steak. If parents don't discipline, their kids won't ever learn right from wrong. You cannot spare the rod without spoiling the child. My father practices what he preaches. I cringe when I hear the sound of his belt coming off. I hear it a lot. There's no begging for mercy either. Not that I would. For my sixth birthday, my parents give me a bike and I learned to ride it with training wheels. But just before I'm seven, my dad removes them and tells me go outside and ride. And out on the sidewalk, I try, but I'm afraid of falling. And I'm so afraid of falling, I can't steady myself on just two wheels. So I start to put the bike away. I hear the garage door open, and I see my father. He walks toward me, holding a four-foot aluminum rod. Get on the bike. Shaking, I climb onto the seat, both feet still on the sidewalk. Put both feet on the pedals, Carol. I try, but I'm too afraid of falling. Just balance. I'm trying, but I don't want to fall. So my other foot stays on the sidewalk. I can't lift it. God damn it, ride the bike. He hits me across the lower back with the metal rod. I draw back to avoid it, but I can't. He hits me again, harder. You're gonna ride that bike. Blows rain down on my back, my legs, but I barely feel them. I can feel the sting of hot welts rising on my skin. Don't cry, I tell my six-year-old self. Don't cry. I ride the bike. I was a precocious first child. I was wanted, I was loved, but I learned very young to see love as brutally conditional and precarious. Even that young, I see the irony. My father, he's a doctor. Yes, a pediatrician. The kids he takes care of, they love him. They giggle when he looks in their ears with an otoscope. Are those carrots in there? He asks. Do you have carrots growing in your ears? Before my parents built the house on the hill, we lived in an apartment above his office and moms would bring their babies in for exams and vaccines. When I was four, I dreamed that I threw their babies down the stairs. 
At home, I avoid my father as much as possible. My mother is silent about my punishments, but then why would she intervene and draw my father's wrath toward her? But my grandmother, she tries to comfort me. Allora mangia, she says, eat. She makes me eggplant parmigiana, she buys cannoli and S cookies from Savoia's bakery, and I eat. One night at dinner, my father turns to me. You're too fat, Carol. You walk like a drunk falling out of a tree. I don't look at him. I don't even know what that means. But really, I do. Books are my escape. You know those stories about families with kindly fathers and nurturing moms who offer milk and cookies after school? I can't get enough of them. I lose myself in teen romances, imagining being swept off my feet by a tall, dark, handsome boy in a letter sweater. By the time I get through junior high, I've read almost every single book in our library. But in eighth grade, Becky has a boy-girl party, my first. No adults, her parents are Unitarian. I'm wearing a brand new daisy print summer dress and someone puts the latest Beatles 45 on the record player. It's called, I Wanna Hold Your Hand. I grab a Coke from the cooler. You hate Coke, Becky says. I don't tell her that I have read all about Coke dates in teen magazines, and I force myself to drink them to practice for when a boy asks me out. Pretty soon, someone fishes an empty bottle out of the trash and we sit on the floor in a circle. I spin and the bottle points to tall, gawky Saul Levine. He's my first kiss doesn't go to our school. I don't even know him. We walk into the powder room. The light switch clicks when he turns it off. We navigate the dark space between us, our glasses clinking together. His lips meet mine. Ugh, thin, dry, passionless. Nothing like the blazing hot fantasy kisses Vic and I exchange in my imagination. One day, my father's older sister, Aunt Vivian, makes a rare visit with her glamorous daughter, Connie. My aunt is delicate. She's fine featured, rail thin, her hair sprayed into a perfect helmet. A warm hug would knock her over. I reach out to kiss her hello as required. Her perfunctory peck back barely grazes my cheek. I survey my cousin Connie. What's with that tight sheath, stilettos, teased hair? She looks like one of the Shangri-Las. I feel like a little kid. My parents show them into our formal living room. It's used only when company comes. The sunken living room has a picture window overlooking the grassy hill behind our house. And the window is shrouded in heavy dark green silk swags held back by ornate gold metal rosettes. On the pure white sculptured carpet sits Italian provincial furniture, legs and arms carved in swirls and painted in gold leaf. The huge marble fireplace has never been defaced by a stick of wood. For first-generation Sicilian Americans, it's the height of elegance. My aunt settles onto the gold brocade sofa. Carol, we were wondering if you would like to be a junior bridesmaid in your cousin Connie's wedding next summer. Yeah, sure, I'd love to. I've never worn a long dress before. Connie smiles. She was the flower girl in my parents' wedding. My aunt looks at me. Honey, you might think about losing a little weight before then. My lip quivers. I do not cry. In 10 years, both of Aunt Vivian's daughters would be obese. That night, 
Fantasy Vic and I meet in my imaginary woods. Our arms are entwined. We're holding each other so tightly. He thinks I'm perfect. I hold on to him for dear life. Yay. <clears throat> Thanks. Hey. I'm six years old. My favorite thing in the whole world is spending time with my dad. And today, he's brought me to Kids Creek to learn how to fish. It's great, except for one thing. I think it was a bad idea to bring my brother, Steve. He's only three. He doesn't care about fishing. He couldn't even carry his own fishing pole. I had to carry both poles and the junior tackle box. My dad puts worms on our hooks and casts our lines way out into the middle of the pond. Take care of your brother. Daddy crosses the bridge because he wants to talk to some friends on the other side of the pond. My dad's a veterinarian, so all the ranchers know him. And as he walks by, they go, hi, doc. Steve puts down his fishing pole and starts throwing dirt clods into the pond. Stop it, you'll scare the fish away. Just sit down and watch your line. I sit down and watch my line and I keep watching it because I want to be the first one to catch a fish today. Splash! My brother Steve is gone. His little green <laughs> baseball cap is floating on the water. Daddy! Steve's in! Across the pond, Daddy hears me. He jumps away from his friends and runs toward the bridge. He's moving so fast that it's like he's in a cartoon. Zoom! As daddy's running across the bridge, a big rancher whose kids are fishing next to me just steps into the pond, reaches under the water, and picks up my brother by the straps of his overalls. Steve is gasping for air and spitting out water. His face is bright red. Now daddy's here. He takes Steve from the rancher's arms. Thank you. Sure, doc. Daddy says thank you again and again. He seems really young, the youngest I've ever seen him. Uh, get the poles and, and, and the tackle box. Daddy trots off across the field, carrying Stevie to the Jeep. I pick everything up and run after him. There wasn't time to reel in the fishing lines and the hooks keep getting caught in the weeds. Daddy has already started the engine by the time I get there. I put the fishing poles and the tackle box in the back and climb into the front seat next to sopping wet Stevie. I wait for daddy to say, good job on getting all that gear so fast, but he doesn't, he doesn't say anything. Steve is sucking his thumb. I put my arm around him and pretty soon I'm as wet as he is. When we're almost home, daddy looks over and says in a weird voice, I told you to watch him. He isn't yelling. It sounds like he's trying to figure it out. Well, it happened really fast. I don't say anything else because daddy doesn't like us to make excuses. When we get home, daddy rushes inside with Stevie but I stay on the porch because I don't want my mom to blame me for Steve being wet. I hear the rumble of mom's voice and then daddy's. And then mom yells, you left him alone with a six-year-old? It sounds like daddy's the one who's in trouble. I'm 10 years old. I have an orange helium balloon tied around my wrist, wrist and I'm skipping around the stage in the Thanksgiving pageant. As I circle the front of the stage, I look for my mom among the parents in the folding chairs, but she's not there. 
Is she standing in the back? No, this is impossible. Mom always comes to my programs. When the pageant's over, the other kids all leave with their parents. I just head for home by myself. Mom is gonna be so upset when she realizes she missed my performance. But when I get home, Andy Irene is standing on our front porch. I don't like her. She wears high heels and red lipstick in the middle of the day. What's she doing here? She almost never comes over. I see Steve and Bruce in the back seat of her big fancy car. Oh, where's mom? Um, she had to go to Montana. Your daddy got sick on his hunting trip. What? Is he okay? We don't know. Your mom will call tonight. You and Steve and Bruce are gonna stay with us. That night, mom calls and talks to Uncle Roy during dinner. I see that my dad is not all right. Uncle Roy's face is pale. And after he hangs up, I hear him say to Annie Irene, a massive heart attack. Bruce and Steve and I are supposed to sleep on the floor in the basement. I can't sleep. I pray and pray that my dad will be okay, but it doesn't work. He dies the next day. When my mother comes home, she's not the mom that I knew. She's broken, but instead of collapsing, she never stops moving. She sells our house. She sells daddy's veterinary practice and she packs up all our stuff. Two days before Christmas, she loads the five of us into the green station wagon and drives over the icy roads and the mountain passes from Idaho to her hometown in Colorado where her parents live. Then mom gets really sick. I'm terrified that she's gonna die too. One day I'm helping Grammy hang out the wash. She mutters, I knew from the first time she brought that man home that she shouldn't marry him. It takes me a moment to realize she's talking about my father. What? Grammy has always been a perfect grandmother, baking molasses cookies, reading to us in the porch swing when we come and visit in the summer. But now I feel a red hot flash of anger toward her. While my mom's getting well, Grammy takes us to the Methodist church. One Sunday morning during coffee hour, two old ladies come over to me and Steve. One of them takes my hand between her plump hands. Jenny Sue, you be good to your mother and help her every way you can. That poor woman taking care of all of you. Don't you give her any trouble. The other one puts her bony hand on Steve's shoulder. You're going to have to step up, young man. You're going to have to take care of your little brother and your sisters and your mother. You're the man of the family now. I want to tell her, what are you doing? Can't you see? He's seven years old. He's little, he wears glasses, he just lost his dad. What in the hell are you talking about? But of course, I can't say anything to them. They're Grammy's friends. Come on, Steve, let's go outside to wait for Grammy. It's cold outside. I hate those old biddies and I hate their church. And you know what? I hate God too. Our family never talked about daddy. At first, we kids don't mention his name because we know that mom couldn't bear it. She misses him too much, but he becomes taboo, unspeakable. And we don't talk about him even when mom's not there. But I dream about him often. In the dreams, he's wearing his coveralls from work his hat's at a jaunty angle. He's standing on a hillside, green, green hillside, across a little valley from me. 
they told me you were dead, but you're not. He nods to show he hears me. I wake up overjoyed that he's alive, but stunned that he wants to live away from us. I decide that I'd much rather be where he is than where I am. I'm 12 years old. Hey guys, I've got an idea. Let's take this raft out to the middle of the lake. That kid who made it won't care. He hasn't been down here for all week. My brothers just keep packing mud into empty coffee cans and turning them upside down to make a village along the edge of the pond. Same as yesterday. My brother Steve is nine, Bruce is seven, and I have to stay down here all day and take care of them while mom's in class. I guess I'll just have to go myself. I take off my tennis shoes, untie the raft, and push it into the water. It's just a couple of beams with four planks nailed on top, about four feet by four feet. When I boost myself onto the raft, it tips, but then I scoop back to the middle and I'm floating. Now they're paying attention. What? Oh, I thought you didn't want to go. All right, but hurry up, leave your shoes and Steve, leave your glasses. They wade out to the raft. I jump off and help them scramble on. There's barely room for the two of them. At first, I walk behind the raft and push it. But when the water gets up to my chest, I start doing the frog kick. I have a strong frog kick. I passed intermediate swimmers back home before we came over here for mom to go to summer school. Whew. This is more like a lake than a pond. Rafting is a lot harder than it looks in that picture in the Huckleberry Finn book. Of course, that raft was a lot bigger and they were on a river. I don't have any current to help me. My legs are getting tired and Steve and Bruce are starting to horse around. Hey guys, stop it. You're gonna tip it over. Ah, here's an idea. Watch me, I'll go down and see how deep it is. It's getting colder and colder, but I don't touch the bottom. It's really deep and it's dark down there. Not like the deep end of the swimming pool where the lifeguards can see the bottom and there aren't any lifeguards here. There's nobody but us at the pond. Well, I'm a strong swimmer and Steve can dog paddle a, a little, but Bruce hasn't had any swimming lessons at all. We better go back. I swim around to the other side of the raft. When I start kicking and push the raft, it tilts and Steve falls, falls on top of Bruce. Bruce pushes back so hard that Steve topples over backward into the water and the raft lurches away from him. Steve comes up sputtering and he's facing the wrong way. Steve, over here. He paddles like mad toward us and finally he reaches the raft, but he can't pull himself on top. I swim around behind him, tread water, grab the back of his pants and lift. It takes three tries, but I finally get him back on the raft. I head back to the shore. By the time we get there, my legs are shaking and I have to lie down on the bank. Steve is soaked and shivering. Hey, let's go home. We can make Rice Krispie treats. Come on. When I'm halfway up the path, an awful thought comes into my mind. What if I was running up this path screaming for help because Steve ha hadn't made it back to the raft? What if he was down in that cold, dark place at the bottom of the pond and it was my fault. That didn't happen. He's right behind me, but it could have happened. I swear I'll never take my brothers into danger. I swear I'll never take my brothers into deep water on a leaky raft again. Mm -hmm. I'm 31 years old. 
I feel something on my leg. I'm on a narrow bed. The whole room is moving and vibrating. A man standing at the foot of my bed is picking up a pinch of fabric from my pants. He has scissors in his hand. These are my good pants. They go with a suit. Gray with a light blue pinstripe. Hey, what are you doing? He jumps and looks at my face wide-eyed like he didn't know I was here. Well, I've, I've got to find out where the blood is coming from. Why didn't you tell me? I unzip my pants and wriggle out of them and everything goes dark again. It's a welcome darkness, soft and velvety. The next time I come out of the dark, there's a red haired guy in purple scrubs blotting the side of my head with gauze. It's cold and wet. Now he's picking something up from a tray. It's a razor. No, <sighs> sorry, I've got to shave your head so they can sew up the cut. I just got this perm last week. I'll take off as little as I, as possible. I feel him shave a wide track from my forehead to my crown. That guy leaves and an old guy and a young guy come over. The, the old guy probes around in my head and speaks in a monotone to the young guy, telling him what to look for in a head wound. I slide back into the dark. I'm in a wheelchair. A middle-aged woman is pushing me into an elevator. There's a ding. And now we're out in a big lobby. Where are we? Mission. Excuse me, <laughs> San Francisco General. What's going to happen to me now? <laughs> We're just going to wait here for your brother. Who? Your brother, Steve. We called him and he's on the way. Before long, the automatic doors slide open and Steve comes in. Jan, what happened? I don't know. How did you know I'm here? Virginia gave them my phone number. Virginia, Virginia was in the car. She was talking and talking at me right up in my face, talking like crazy. Yeah, she is crazy right now. She went off her meds, remember? You were driving her back to the psychiatric ward at Mission Terrace after we took her out to dinner. Where is Virginia? Is she hurt? No. They said she's fine. They said they would take her back to Mission Terrace. A woman in a navy blue pantsuit comes over carrying a big plastic bag. She checks my hospital bracelet and puts the bag in my lap. I see that my pinstripe pants are red with blood. When can I leave? I have to go home and soak these pants before the stain sets. The woman who's been pushing my wheelchair frowns at Steve like she's worried. She hands him a sheet of instructions and tells him what to look out for, for someone who's had a concussion. She wheels me out through the sliding doors and out to the curb. Steve helps me into his VW bug. Steve finds a good parking place close to my apartment. As soon as we get inside, I run a sink full of cold water and scrub and scrub at the blood in my pants. Wait a minute, there's a cut in the left pant leg. That guy cut it after I told him not to. Well, I guess I can sew it up, but I don't know if these blood stains are gonna come out of the pants. Jen, you've got to go to bed. Steve takes the pants, wrings them out, and hangs them over the faucets in the shower. He checks to see if my pupils are the same size, and then he guides me to bed and tucks me in. He pulls up a chair and sits down beside me. 
when I close my eyes, I see red, 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 and finally black. Steve's asleep on the sofa when I wake up the next morning. My back and neck hurt so much that he has to help me out of bed. He drives me to the lot where my car was towed so I can sign a release. It's a huge graveyard of totaled cars and trucks. The guy in the office gets my paperwork and takes us to Tommy Toyota. He has me sign the form and then he heads back to the office and Steve follows him, but I can't stop staring at Tommy. The door on the driver's side is crushed so far inward that it looks like the letter C. The windshield is shattered. I start to remember. Virginia raving, me speeding up so I can make it up the next hill on Dolores Street, a blaze of light, shriek of metal against metal, disconnected voices yelling, red lights flashing, a flashlight in my face, and then the mercy of absolute darkness. Steve comes back to get me. Come on, Janny, let's go home. Hey. So here I am at STFU, you. That's shut the fuck up university. Shut the fuck up in your head, basically, since no one is talking except for the teachers and the turkeys. The turkeys are so loud all day long. They're not shutting the fuck up. They're loud. And I have chosen this. And I have paid big bucks to shut the fuck up for an entire month. We have thousands of thoughts in our heads, at least in my head anyway. He said this and she said that and he did this and I did that and on and on and on into these interminable fights inside my head. Well, so that's why I'm here. But no, that's not the only reason why I'm here. Anyway, uh, I am here at a month long silent meditation retreat in Marin County, California. IA. Yeah, wow. But well, ever since the first week, I have just been kind of crazed with this one obsession with this one person. I'll call her Lulu Lemon. And I have to see her every day. Okay, so let me tell you how it all began. I'm at my yoga class with my teacher Tahara, who I love. And since I'm a chronic latecomer, I get there early making a wise effort as they call it. It's the fifth parami, or maybe it's the eighth. Anyway, I place my mat in the center of the room opposite the Buddha statue and the place where Tahara will be sitting. I always like to be right in front of Tahara. She's, a, she's an African-American woman of strong body and mind, and she seems totally planted on terra firma. She's also quite beautiful, but uh, that's just between uh, us because my, my partner gets jealous. The only other person in the room walks over to me and she bows. E excuse me, dear, excuse me. Tahara is ill today. The class has been canceled. Oh gosh, that's terrible. I'm so disappointed. Shortly after that, several other women come into the room and they head for the closet to get their mats. Excuse me, excuse me, the class is canceled, okay? Tahara isn't coming, she's ill today. One of the women smiles and nods and then she continues to take her mat and set herself up. The other, young, lithe, attractive, 
flaunting an auburn French braid and Lululemon yoga attire, she doesn't even look at me. Dar is not coming, okay? Class is canceled. Dar is ill today. Excuse me? Hello? Hello? Dar is not, she's not coming. Dar is ill today. Class is canceled. She just stares at me with this placid superiority and she glides with her mat into the room. She's not coming. I am taking double silence and I choose not to talk to you today. Well, I'm taking double silence. And I don't want to talk to you either. She's sneering at me now, and the daggers are shooting from her eyes. Look, I just didn't know if you knew that the class was canceled. You know, I was just trying to be helpful. Why is she pointing at the door? Oh, okay. Well, you know, that sign obviously wasn't there when I first came in. Hmm. Anyway, God, how dare she talk to me like that? Or not talk to me like that? I mean, embarrass and humiliate me in front of everyone. It's just trying to be nice. <sighs> Look at her. Look at her, so high and mighty with her purple and lavender yoga ensemble. Who the fuck does she think she is? Trying to make me look like I'm the asshole, bitch. Of course, um, you know, anger is not the right response here. As our teacher Gretel would say, it's all about upeka or that Sanskrit for equanimity responding and not reacting. Yeah, sometimes you just need to stand and observe and you know, observe your breath. Breathing in, breathing out. Or if you can't do that, as our teacher Gretel would say, then just step the hell away. It's one of the four sublime immeasurables. But instead of stepping away, I seethed all throughout the rest of the yoga period. Oh, God, look at her now, doing a fucking headstand, fucking show off. She doesn't even do it that well. She's tilting. You know what? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to unroll my mat right next to hers, and then I'm going to stare at her until she falls on her face. Flawless fucking face. Oh, God. You know, why does somebody like this woman, a total stranger, have this effect on me? I don't get it. And why am I just letting her get the best of me? I, I, I know I'm not supposed to be angry this way. So what's the matter with me? I just can't seem to control myself around these things, you know? I just get so crazy. Jesus, like I rammed that old lady with my cart in the Whole Foods. Rammed it right into her. Yeah, well, that was what got me here in the first place. And let me tell you, it wasn't pretty. No, no, no. I definitely, I definitely need to rethink my thinking. But first, I got to get to the dining room for lunch. I am in the first shift of dishwashers. That's my yogi work assignment. And I only get about 20 minutes to eat. During each meal, we practice what's called mindful eating, but that's endless. And I really don't have time for that. All around the silent table, the yogis all with their eyes closed, they're tasting, they're chewing, they're swallowing all in these minute steps. Like there's the slow roll 
And then there's the, the tongue swish and, and the licking of the lips and the endless chew, endless chew. And all the while they are smiling, smiling like they're in another world or more like a fucking psych ward. I head towards the kitchen and my dishwashing job and I walk by a table of vegetable chopper yogis preparing zucchinis for tonight's dinner. Well, I declare if it isn't Miss Lulu Lemon herself, I wonder if she knows I'm here. I'm sure she's not looking at me on purpose. I watch her every move how meticulously she inspects each zucchini, places it strategically on the cutting board, and then slices it with surgical precision. I inch a little bit closer and maybe, you know, maybe I can make her nervous enough, she'll drop her knife. Ooh, or even better, she'll slice her finger right off. There it went. Ah, ah, I know that's kind of gross, bit over the top, but wouldn't it just be ever so cool to watch the blood just gushing out and then splurting and splashing and oh, everywhere, like a huge gigantic volcano erupting, you know, and this completely covering her from head to toe and just fucking ruining her fancy, fucking yoga attire. <laughs> because I'll tell you what, nobody, and I mean nobody, is going to fuck with me and get away with it. Oh my God, did you see that? You, you saw that, right? Oh my God. She just pointed her knife at me. I swear to God, right, right out in the open. She, just like that. Well, you must have seen it. I mean, how could you not? So obvious. <sighs> I'm telling you, this, this bitch, this bitch, this bitch is bad. <sighs> well, thank God I have made it to my meditation. And thank God for my meditation teacher, Gretel. I like Gretel and I just love her Southern drawl and her quirky demeanor. Whenever she guides us, there's just a lot of laughter in the hall. I mean, she's a bit unorthodox to be sure, <laughs> but man, she is just such a welcome relief from the stifling seriosity of it all. All right, hi. Well now squeeze your shoulders, squeeze them. Squeeze them tight, good, clench, and clench those fists. Come on now, that's right. Hold them tight, good, good. And now the corner of your eyes, squeeze them, squeeze them, squeeze them, squeeze them tight, good, and hold and hold. And now your jaws, squeeze them, clench them, clench them tight, clench it. Oh, and now your buttocks, your booty, your buttocks, your caboose, your tuchus, your booty, whatever you call it. Right now, just clench them up, clench them up. Come on now, clench them real tight. That's right, clench them up and release. <laughs> Good letting go, y'all. All right, now, come on now, let's do some meta or loving kindness practice. This time I like you to pick someone that you got kind of a beef with, with someone, you know, you're upset or angry with and just put them in your mind. And now I'd like you to silently go ahead and radiate out all that meta to them. Okay, okay. I am radiating out feelings of love and warmth and kindness. Do you feel me, Lulu? Okay, y'all doing great. Keep it up now. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Lulu, for, uh, you know, whatever it is that I'm sorry for. Uh, no, okay. I'm ashamed of my behavior. Kind of, sort of. 
dig deeper, y'all. Come on. Uh, I'm digging, I'm digging, I'm digging. And I know that I should know better and I, I do know better and I'm not going to get trapped in all of this rage and petty bullshit. I'm just gonna, Lululemon, I would like to offer you love. But you just make me feel like a goddamn piece of shit person and you don't even deserve a teeny tiny chewed up morsel of my love. No, no, no. Okay, totally wrong. Totally drop the story. Drop the story. Come on, drop it. Drop it. Drop it. <laughs> there. <sighs> Look at her, huh? She's in the second row, right in front of Gretel, teacher's pet, with her prize winning posture and her Tibetan yak shawl. Bet she's not radiating out meta to me. Y'all come back now. Open your eyes. All right. Come on back to the room. My, oh my, y'all look positively radiant. So mm, thank you for your kind attention today. And I just want to remind you as you go back out into your day, be mindful. And remember, drop your story. Y'all making progress. After the guided meditation, I realized I forgot to check the message board in the lobby. I do it every day in the message board. It's how we, the teachers and the staff, they communicate with us. You know, the messages that are written on these tiny white slips of paper. They're recycled, of course. Oh, hey, look at that. I got mail. Oh, oh how nice. It's from uh, Maureen. Maureen, I remember Maureen. We spoke at dinner the first night. Only, you know, it's the only time we could talk. Okay. Please be aware that you are not permitted to put your color clothes in with the whites in the community washing machine, well, of course. We are not responsible for your laundry. It could be confiscated. Maureen, <sighs> laundry yogi. Okay, well, hey, I, I got another one though. Yeah, I got another one. Oh my God, it's from Zane. I know Zane. Yeah, nice guy. I met him the first day on the line for the room assignments. Hey, Zane. Okay, hello. Um, uh, my name is Zane. I'm the bathroom yogi. I was cleaning the bathroom in your dorm this morning and I was totally overwhelmed uh, with your heavily scented products. As you know, this is against the strict fragrance-free policy uh, set up so that those of us who are allergic can safely um, use the bathrooms and whatever. You know what? My friends were right. This is prison. but I just always feel free in my meditation class. And thank goodness, Tahara is feeling better. So gosh, she's back and I am back on the cushion. Breathing in and breathing out. I am trying not to think about my laundry and my shower in fractions. Drop it, just drop it. Listening to the sound of Tahara's mellifluous voice, it's calming me down and I'm going deeper and deeper, down, down, down. <sighs> I see a woman, it's Lulu and she's holding a sword and she's dressed in an orange robe like ceremonial monk attire. Huh except it has these shocking pink logos all over it. And she's wearing some kind of, I don't know, it's like a headpiece. 
looks more like moose antlers. And nestled on the branches are these multi-ethnic Barbie dolls, all in exotic yoga poses. Lulu is perched high atop a very large Tibetan yak, and she's very quiet and very ill. But the yak, the yak is very talkative. The yak approaches me. Why have you come here to this land, cranky cricket? Um, well, I, I can't seem to obey the rules. Ah, so you are rebellious. Well, you know, I do seem to like to cut corners sometimes. So you cheat then. I always know it. You're a big fat cheater. That's what you are. Oh my God, it's my friend Pam. What is she doing here? Huh. And why is everyone turning against me? You're a liar, that's why. You're a liar. Liar, liar, pants on fire. And you didn't bring the lettuce to the barbecue either. What's up with that? God, you ruined everything. Well, I tried, Pam. I mean, I got hung up, okay? I, all right, I didn't, know, I didn't tell you, okay, what really happened. You nearly killed me in the produce department at the Whole Foods. Oh my God, lady, I barely bumped you with my cart. I mean, look, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you dropped your phone. I'm sorry your phone broke, but stalking me here is not the answer. Well, you didn't just break my phone. You broke and banged my shins and broke one, but even worse, you crushed my spirit. I thought I was still safe out in the world, at least in my own supermarket. But you took it all away from me. Your hatred and anger knows no bounds. Yeah, well, I had wanted to tell Pam that I bashed the old lady with my cart, but, you know, I was ashamed. Why are you holding that knife, cranky cricket? I don't know. Um, it's not my knife, it's her knife, you know, Lulu. And she's trying to kill me. <sighs> Look at her. She is sitting so quietly on my back and she is not harming anyone. She has no weapons, no guys, and yet you persist with your anger and your recriminations. Yeah, but she's the one that pointed the knife at me in your mind. No, oh, but I, I saw her with my own two eyes, didn't I? But did you really, Cricket, huh? Oh, well, I'm, 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 I'm sure I did. I mean, I, I, maybe, I, I don't know. I don't really know. I mean, maybe I did it. I don't know. I am so, so confused. I don't even know who I am anymore. It doesn't matter. Drop your knife now and drop your story. The yak does a kind of a majestic downward facing dog and Lulu gracefully slides off of its back. I open my eyes and I see Tahara. She's sitting directly in front of me with this sort of concerned look on her face. I tell her what just happened. Oh, Madre, I have been there, believe you me. And these Vipassana Vendettas, girl, they can sure make your life a holy hell. Tahara. Um, help. Yay. Yeah. <clears throat> uh. Trina, welcome. What brought you here today? Well, girl, 
Fast forward over, meeting for coffee, long walks on the beach, and riding the glitter rainbow Ferris wheel in lesbian khakis. Just hit us with the dirty, nasty boom boom parts. No. <laughs> Trina, please excuse Popo's need for chisme. <laughs> Our recent breakup support group does not require revealing any details. Thank you. Soon be happy. <laughs> it's soon to be happy. Soon to be happy. Got it. Okay. Char Rodriguez and I are in love. Our butch femme relationship is an endless rom-com movie fest. During the week, HR stays in my apartment in San Francisco and I take her out on strolls to the Presidio and watch the lavender sunset set in. She gets a cat sitter or drives back early to feed Gigi and Pippi Socks her cats. On the weekends, I stay in HR's apartment in Oakland and we walk around Lake Merritt drive up to the Oakland Hills. See, both of us are remote workers, so we sit side by side, or I am all day, like sharing a bowl of lesbian popcorn. Mm -mm. Mas si salt, por favor. Mm -mm -mm. This is the perfect amount of grass-fed butter, mi amor. I send her new wave playlists, and she texts me, Latinx torch songs. Babe, guess what treat I got for you? Uh, lime, chocolate, <gasps> flores. Happy six months, Trina. <sighs> the cats take turns sleeping at our feet. And every Sunday, babe, breakfast in bed again? Muchísimas gracias. De nada, preciosa. Besos. Folks, I have all of HR's attention. I am the It Girl. We invite our friends for mutual Japantown sushi and karaoke, and I select with HR the love boat, but make up our own lyrics on the way home. The les boat. Something exciting for every dyke. The les boat, come aboard and then you'll score. Ba -da 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 -da. Our first trip to Yosemite, HR gets me an emerald necklace. And I think, this is it. She's my person forever. She's committing to me. Trina, would you ever move in with me? And the cats. Um, sure, babe. Uh, no, no pressure, of course. Uh, yes, uh, maybe, um, maybe down the road. You know, we're cruising on the sea. I don't want to rock the boat now. <laughs> like, uh, like John Legend says, you know, take it slow. <clears throat> Excuse me, group facilitator here. Can we move it along with your story? Where was I? Happy six months, now happy one year anniversary, Trina. Make a wish. <sighs> Yippee! And you too, Gigi and Pippi Socks. This is very, very expensive catnip. Yummy, yummy. <laughs> Yay. <clears throat> HR, would you ever wear a ring if I got you one? Mm, sure, babe. How about... Matching rings. Uh, maybe. HR, honey, we're like the species that mate for life, right? Like penguins. <laughs> no, I thought it was lobsters or seahorses. <laughs> Folks, wait. HR said she wanted to live with me and the cats. Why doesn't she just say, Trina, will you marry me? Then one day, whoa, okay. So Trina, you're, you're not a cat lover or a pet lover, but a cat ally. 
Uh, I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, I'm totally a, a pet, a cat ally. Mm -hmm. Wow, I, I thought you were a pet lover. Y you, <laughs> HR babe, you seem uh, disappointed. No, it's fine. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go walk around Lake Merritt. Okay, I got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Super busy. Um, um. And love won't hurt anymore. Next weekend. Oh man, Trina, I'm done with the rom-coms. I mean, oh, wait a minute, it's five. Hey, how about Die Hard? Uh, I'm sorry, I feel like you're pulling away from me, babe. I just, um, I don't wanna go back and forth across the bridge anymore. You know, Bay Bridge toll, it's, just, it's getting expensive, you know? I just wanna stay in my place. Well, I feel like you're pulling away from me, babe. <laughs> Um, no, uh, you know what you can say, you can stay here, uh, for a four day weekend. Yeah. Long weekend. Okay. Sure. Uh, I think I'm going to take a walk around the lake, hun. And then, <clears throat> honey, HR. Yeah. Uh, hello. <clears throat> You know, every weekend, we're kind of doing everything with the cats. We're like combing the cats, petting the cats, <laughs> watching bird movies with the cats, going shopping with the cats, sleeping with the cats. <clears throat> I miss you in my home and our walks in San Francisco together. What? You know, Trina, I think we're just like really different. You're more of a bachelorette at heart. And I like to nest in my home. What? A bachelorette? What What are you talking about? You're more of a, a free spirit. Folks, I have no idea what HR is talking about. <clears throat> Excuse me, facilitator again, time out. Why didn't you just suck it up and go to the East Bay and move in with her? Because our relationship is, was per perfect, you know. But then, HR, babe, hon, can we talk? Yeah, what's up, Trina? You don't seem like yourself anymore and we haven't had sex in weeks and weeks and weeks. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I've been feeling a little shut down lately, but um, I, yeah, I don't know why. Okay. Sure. Okay. Folks, it wasn't okay. I, I thought that HR would have a turnaround, you know, open up to me. Snap out of her malaise. Les boat again. So she starts going to therapy. Talking to the cats more than me. <laughs> working long hours. I'm trying to be a supportive girlfriend. We go out to dinner. HR? Honey? Babe? What? Mm? What is it? Yeah? Uh-huh. What? I am no longer beloved? HR, uh, you wanna wanna make dinner together and eat by candlelight? No, no, I'm finishing the game. Let's uh let's eat on the couch. And play fishing pole dancing with the cats again? Great, sure, okay. I bring two plates of food over. Gigi and Pippi Socks are sitting on either side of her. I'll just sit over here in the hard chair. Yes, 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 go, go, go! Woo! Warriors, 
They won. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Warriors. Woo. Mm. Thanks, hon. Um, Peter, you can sit over here with us on the couch. Can I? Can I, babe? Can I sit over there with you on the couch? You don't have to be snippy. Not snippy, babe. Mm -hmm. HR, uh, how about we watch a romantic movie tonight? You know, like, like old times. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, oh, hey, Titanic's on. How about that? Honey, that's a cautionary tale about sleeping on the job and underestimating the need for more lifeboats. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, man. I've always wanted to see like water for chocolate. Looks good. Looks really romantic, babe. HR? What? Pedro has a heart attack. He dies. Tita eats matches. She dies. The end. Spoiler alert, much? Trina, uh, where are you going, babe? <laughs> HR, I'm going into the bedroom. I'm going to watch women on the verge of a nervous breakdown, babe. So, you break up. No. HR has a turnaround. Okay, okay, fine. Let's, let's do it, Trina. Let's do it. Let's take the canoe trip together. Really? Goody. You know, Sonoma's so beautiful this time of year. It's, it's just gonna be perfect on the, on the river, rowing side by side, just the two of us. I love you, Trina. I love you too, HR. On the car ride home. Uh, HR, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know that possible flooding and harsh rain, would be, <laughs> there was nothing about a hurricane. <laughs> I'm soaked, you're soaked. Glad I didn't bring the cats. Okay, well, honey, how about I rub your feet when we get, or you can just slam the door and I'll just talk in the car by myself while you walk in the house. No, that's fine, I, I like doing this, it's, it's good. She takes a long shower. I act like I'm asleep when she gets into bed. Oh my God. No, I love you and I love you. I love you and I love you. I love both of you. She's basically talking to the cats. And doesn't reach out to me. In the middle of the night, HR is spooning Gigi. And Pippi is curled up on her backside. I am literally blocked out. In a last ditch effort. And love won't hurt anymore. I show up at HR's doorstep with her favorite vegan cheesecake and plenty of catnips for the cat. Humming, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. babe, got something for you. And the cats, I kick off my shoes and slide my feet into my slippers. Da, da, da. Oh, ow! What happened? What happened? Your cat's shit in my slipper. Are you okay? Uh no, I fell on my ass. I'll get you some ice. And poo pooed in my slipper too, on my foot. They tried to kill me. Can you keep your voice down? You're, you're freaking out Pippi. Pippi is very sensitive. Oh my God, he's crying in the corner. Here, here boy, here boy. Just, just, just say, I'm sorry, Pippi. I'm sorry, Pippi. I'm sorry, Pippi. I'm sorry, Pippi. Get your fucking cat out of my face. This is all your fault, Pippi. Mm, mm, mm. Don't you dare ever devil talk to my cat again. Stop cat gaslighting me. Rawr! This is your fault too, Gigi. This is your shit. Just say poo poo or caca, but do not say shit. It's her shit, it's his shit. St stop, stop being mean to them. Stop placating them. Stop making them the enemy. What's the life expectancy of a cat anyway, HR? Good. 
I'm taking a time out from you, Trina. You are being very, very mean right now. What? I still need ice. Folks, our final words. HR, maybe, maybe there's a chance. We could, we could all go to feline therapy together. Just give me one more chance. Trina, Trina Marina, this relationship has not been working for a long time. I've tried, you've tried. I'm sorry. I'm pretty miserable. I'm sorry. This is done. I will always love you. And folks, that was it. Hey. Hey. Thank you very much for coming tonight and thanks to the performers and be sure and join uh, the Marsh on all our other great shows. Check out the website for the things going on all week long. Good night. Ooh.